This is Outbreak News This Week, brought to you by the Global Dispatch Incorporated. Outbreak News This Week is your source for all the news about worms and germs. And now, your host, microbiologist and editor of OutbreakNewsToday.com. Here's Robert Harriman. Well, good afternoon, Tampa Bay. And yes, I'm back to give you your weekly dose of news and information on worms and germs. My name is Robert, and this is Outbreak News This Week. And yeah, I primarily focus on infectious disease news and the associated outbreaks, hence worms and germs. But also on the show, from time to time, I'll look at uh, other topics, topics in general health and medicine, and sometimes I'll even delve into health policy, which um, fascinates me to a certain extent. So whatever catches my fancy that particular week. And it's uh, really great to be back uh, from my most recent hiatus. Uh, I've been at at this radio station about four years now, and I'm glad to be back at my uh, seat at the AM 1380 The Biz Studio and working once again with the great Michael Miracle. And uh, while I do this show one hour a week, um, I also have other sources of news and information at the website. That's OutbreakNewsToday.com. And there's a podcast we have. It's called Outbreak News Interviews. It's an interview-based podcast, and that's can be found on the website and also on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher Radio, and Spotify. So I encourage you to check that out. And... Um, Today's topic is going to be one of the more interesting topics in infectious diseases and uh, likely the most lethal if it's not treated appropriately, and that's rabies. Well, rabies has been a topic on this show several times, and I've looked at a variety of different issues related to this lethal virus. But today I want to look at rabies from a little bit of a different set of topics. I want to look at some history some mythology, public health, and diagnostics. Well, joining me to look at rabies today is Texas State University Program Chair for the Clinical Laboratory Science Program and friend of the show, Rodney Rohde, PhD. Dr. Rohde, welcome back to the show. Thanks, Robert. It's always a great pleasure to be here and join you and talk about public health and other issues. Yes, sir. Thank you so much. Well, I know rabies is a topic you love to talk about and you love to write about. Uh, can you just give the audience a little bit of background? What's your background in rabies? Sure. After I finished my degrees here at Texas State back in the 80s and early 90s, I uh, I went to work at the Texas Department of Health in Austin, Texas. And while there for about a decade, I was a public health and clinical microbiologist and also kind of this new interesting field at that point called molecular epidemiology. And while there, I also had the amazing opportunity to be a two-time a uh, visiting scientist at the Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta and actually received specialized molecular diagnostic training under Gene Smith and Dr. Charles Ruprecht, who are really two American giants in the field of rabies. So just an amazing opportunity, very blessed to do that. And then I was also an inaugural member of the Texas Oral Rabies Vaccination Program, which actually eliminated canine rabies from Texas back in the uh, 90s, early 2000s. Um, which was a program that delivered vaccines aerially from aircraft to immunize wildlife. So really cool. And then one of my last points of pride, I guess, from that time period in my career was I helped establish the Rabies Virus Reference Laboratory at the Department of Health in Austin there that would allow other states and even other countries to send specimens to me to type uh, to figure out you know, the story behind the infection, the type of virus, the viral variants, maybe the geography, what was going on. It's really one of the first in the nation at that time. Oh, very good. Well, I want to look at a topic that I've never explored on the show before, and that's the history of rabies, which is a fascinating topic all by itself. Um, Dr. Rohde, can you give the audience a short or semi-short history of rabies? <laughs> That is a that is a question in of itself. Can I do it in a short time? I'm going to try, Robert. It's, it's as you know, a fascinating, obviously a diabolical and deadly disease, but it does have some fast, fascinating history associated with it. It's really lost in antiquity. I mean, it goes way back, and so just 
maybe a few bullet points as we build up to more modern times, but all the way back uh, in the writings of Plutarch, uh, it was kind of first observed in mankind in those days. In the Iliad, Homer talks about it. He mentions um, Sirius, the dog star of Orion, having the ability to uh, have a malignant influence upon the health of mankind. And even in Homer, uh, he uses the term raging dogs uh, being thrown at Hector. And, and I mean, just on and on. Um, Aristotle in the 4th century wrote about it in the Natural History of Animals in Book 8, Chapter 22. It's one of the first recorded descriptions, and the quote is that dogs suffer from the madness, and this causes them to become very irritable, and all animals they bite become diseased. So even in that time, they, they understood that something was going on between animals with this this kind of mad, kind of raging type of madness that dogs were showing. They also started understanding and recording a hydrophobia uh, because he was, uh, Hippocrates himself actually talked about persons in that time frame being in a frenzy from this madness and they would drink very little, very disturbed, frightened and so forth and even trembling. So starting to kind of talk about the central nervous system involvement. And, and as it goes on through the time of, of Roman, uh, the Roman Empire and things like that, uh, there were other writings um, that, you know, the disease was being spread by biting dogs, but they actually were also writing that persons who became rabid could possibly spread the disease by biting or, you know, other other transfer of body specimens like saliva. And then the first time infectivity of saliva by rabid dogs was described was uh, by a Roman writer also during that time. And he actually talked about it as an infectious material, as a poison. Um, and, and as you might know, poison is kind of the literal meaning, a Latin meaning for virus. So, you know, it just goes on and on, and it kind of moved through that time. And in every writing and every every culture and every time frame, as you move from antiquity to current times, you see this kind of unfolding in different ways. And certainly, you know, these types of things had some truth, and really quite a bit of truth, but also some falsehoods that we learned later were not totally true. And really those those ideas and theories persisted until the 19th century, which is when we get to Pasteur. Right. And, you know, of course, Louis Pasteur was a giant in infectious diseases. And um, Dr. Rohde, how important was Louis Pasteur concerning rabies? Well, personally, and I, I'm sure a lot of my friends and colleagues would agree with me, he, he was the most important in my mind. I mean, there's been amazing uh, scientists throughout throughout history, especially in the last you know, 100, 150 years that have done some amazing things, including up to today. But with respect to just the volume of work uh, that Louis Pasteur did concerning rabies is, is, is almost overwhelming when you read information around him. And just his brilliance as a scientist, actually his birth date, September 28th, which is coming up, is now celebrated uh, as World Rabies Day. It's kind of an awareness day, so I'm sure we'll be revisiting that on your show or, or as one of your posts. But just some interesting tidbits about him, if I have a couple of minutes to share those with you. Please go ahead. Um, as a nine-year-old um, where he lived, he actually witnessed um, a young child that had been bitten by a rabid wolf that was brought back to a blacksmith shop for treatment. And you might remember this. During that time, one of the things they did when when someone had rabies was they cauterized the wounds with basically a red hot iron, you know, from like a blacksmith shop. Mm -hmm. And he also witnessed about eight or ten community members from the town he was living in that had been bitten that died of that. So early on, you know, very early in his life, maybe some seeds were planted about this this horrible disease. And and then he kind of went on kind of a educational, you know, tr track. Going and I won't list everything, but he went through different universities and different uh, French academies of sciences, and and he actually was quite successful in physics and chemistry. He completed master's degrees and and did uh, quite a bit of work uh, with his theses around uh, crystalline forms of chemicals and polarization of light. And some of his early work actually is still being looked at in kind of contemporary research with molecular physics and chemistry. So 
you know, a brilliant man, obviously, and, and he kind of went through the professor route and became a dean of the faculty of science. And, and what I'd kind of like to make a point about during this early time in his life is he, he, he kind of transitioned, which is something I think all scientists would love to do, and that is practical applications in science. So everybody knows about his pasteurization, you know, and other things that he's kind of famous for, but because of that early success, that really helped save France uh, with fermentation and kind of preserving different types of things. He really became known as labeled as the people's scientist. So I always think that's kind of an interesting comment because he was just adored um, as he went through his life, even before the rabies vaccine. So he's very popular, and he actually was one of the first scientists to turn that popularity um, in his home country to his advantage for financial support in government and by the public. He started working with some other amazing people. Emily uh, Rowe helped contribute more than anyone to his success. They were both super strong-willed, but their synergy together for about 20 years or so created some very productive times through the, really through the late 80s of 1800. And, and one other comment that some people may not know about is he loved children, uh, all children, and he lost his third child to an infectious disease. And so many believe that that was his time of life where vaccines um, kind of took hold of his imagination because it was the same time Jenner uh, developed the smallpox vaccine that you know most people know became a miracle vaccine. And, and interestingly enough, even at that time, Robert, um, there was anti-vaccination uh, kind of coming out from people who claim, you know, vaccines were poison and things like that. So I always think that's kind of interesting, even in the in the mid 1800s, that was going on. It's always been around. Yep. Oh man, it's it's a bad deal, but it's, mm-hmm. it is around. Pasteur is a great admirer of Jenner um, with this idea of preventing infection. So let me just hit some highlights because I know we got time to go through some other things. But this was really fate, I think. Um, all during this time, even though people didn't really understand Jenner's vaccine on how it worked, it was important enough that the Academy, the National Academy of Medicine, recommended general vaccination for the the country. So it's like fate, you know, was with Pasteur. He was like at the right time, at the right place to do this work. His first success was a chicken cholera vaccine using kind of chemical attenuation. And then he changed his attention to rabies. And so that was around 1880. So, I mean, this time frame is just, it's called the golden period of microbiology. Just so much going on, so many amazing researchers and scientists. And that's when he began working to isolate rabies virus from both dog and human saliva. Interestingly enough, uh, when he was doing this early on, he actually identified a figure eight shaped microbe from patients who not only had rabies, but they had all other sorts of illnesses and he named it the pneumococcus. Mm-hmm. So he actually, you know, saw streptococcus uh, pneumonia very early and kind of was part of that finding. This was also during Cox postulates time, you know, so just lots of things going on. So moving more into rabies, he, uh, what, what they were trying to do, him and his team, is they were collecting this saliva, which sounds crazy, but they were caging rabid dogs and actually collecting saliva to get the virus. And then they were infecting rabbits. Um, and, and, and most people who know about vaccines early on, they know what they did. They kind of pushed it through um, uh, passages of, of rabbit population. So the goal was to eventually uh, attenuate or weaken the virus to the point where you could then challenge uh, other animals and test and eventually humans. And again, destiny struck. Um, During that time, a young boy named Joseph Meister uh, was attacked by a grocer's dog, and his local physician actually sent him to Paris to consult with Pasteur because of all the work he was doing. And Pasteur, along with a couple of physicians, really esteemed uh, Paris physicians, uh, because he he didn't have a medical medical license or medical training. So he actually didn't administer the first vaccine, but he was there in consultation. He obviously obviously created it. And they said he was just sick and worried the whole time. So during this whole time, it it was going on. After about three months, when the child was still healthy after being vaccinated, 
he wrote um, a statement to the Academy of Sciences, and really the rest is history. I mean, a storm of of attention came. He became known as you know vaccine authority in this area. And the other really critical thing in this time period towards the end of the 1800s was uh, the first Americans, four New Jersey children, uh, were bitten and and pretty sure uh, they knew they were going to come down with rabies. So Carnegie, Andrew Carnegie and a bunch of other philanthropy was put together and funded the passage of these four boys to Paris. And they eventually cured those those American children also. So that really changed not just France and Europe, but but the world, because it really influenced a whole generation of Americans kind of about how they thought about science and medicine. You know, it really, one of, one of the phrases that you hear about during this time is that it was the opening of the door for new doctors and new medicine, kind of versus the old ways and the old doctors. Yeah, such an, such an important thing. And, and as the audience may or may not know, that rabies is about... 100% fatal. So this this news is just this historical news is just uh, so critical for um, the past century and a half. Right. It was just explosive. Well, Dr. Rohde, like other diseases of antiquity, say the plague or smallpox, uh, the rabies stories must be filled with myth and folklore uh, like the others. Um, do you have any stories to share? Sure, I've got I've got a few. Now, you know, we could go on and on in this area, but certainly, um, and I think most people know this. I've actually been uh, in discussion sometimes with students, for instance, at the college level that have these uh, questions about zombies. You know, and and even it, it kind of goes all the way back to the idea of vampires uh, as a way that that rabies was connected to bats and things like that. So that's the first comment I make is that even our our literature and our movies and entertainment, you know, have been built around rabies, maybe more than any disease. It would be interesting to do do that study. Um, I mean, rabies has influenced, you know, even up to today, right? So The Walking Dead, The Fear of the Walking Dead, World War Z, mm -hmm. um, I Am Legend. I mean, just some really interesting movies about zombies. But if you watch and you understand the science behind uh, the history of rabies, you can see the, you know, the tread marks there of kind of that having an influence. Some people, this is kind of a pet peeve of mine, you know, Robert, I still teach um, microbiology to a variety of different majors, including um, nursing students and our own clinical lab science students. And to this day, whenever I teach virology, and I mention rabies, I still get questions about people that believe uh, Treatment-wise, you're going to get 20 or more shots to the stomach, mm -hmm. you know, and probably by some horribly long needle. But as you know, uh, today's treatment regimen is really only about four vaccines, right. uh, kind of run out over about a month. So, so we'll get to that late later, maybe. But that's always one that still persists: is this kind of in the stomach uh, treatment pattern. The other one uh, that I find happening a lot where I live in Texas, um, and probably in your area too in Florida, is just kind of the the connection of bats. And um, I mean, we bats are wonderful. We all know they do great things, and one of the things they do is they they eat lots of insects. Mm -hmm. And um, but there's still folks. I get cold calls and emails about you know, can I get rabies from bats getting tangled up in your hair? Um, and and that's that is that is a possible exposure. And we're going to talk about exposure later, probably. But it's really not true. I mean, you're not going to get rabies from bats getting in your hair or something like that. So these types of misconceptions, you know, are linked to the media and historical writing, and and even um, I came across in some of the research I'm doing. I'm, I'm writing a book currently over rabies and. The Andy Griffith Show, of all things, had an episode with Barney Fife discussing bats in caves and their potential for laying rabies eggs <laughs> in a person's hair. So, I and mean, you can kind of almost envision Barney Fife talking about this in his panic. But you know, I think these myths are certainly influenced um, through media, and that's really pronounced, obviously, in today's world. And the last one I would mention gets to kind of really important stuff because sometimes I'll have people ask me, 
on the on the uh, area of exposure. You know, can I get rabies, Dr. Rohde, if I handle blood or feces or urine? And really the simple answer is no. Uh, rabies is not transmitted through blood or urine or feces of an infected animal, and it's really not spread airborne, uh, only in really concentrated um, events like in a laboratory or maybe a cave, and even then it's really rare. So, so yeah, just that's just a sampling, but there's multiple types of myths that are out there like any disease. Yeah, and it's amazing with the vaccine to uh, vaccinate animals and to uh, vaccinate humans that are exposed, it, rabies continues to be a menace to many parts of the world. Um, Dr. Rohde, what countries still struggle to get a handle on rabies, human rabies? Well, fortunately, I mean, unfortunately, it's still out there and it's happening. I guess fortunately in the U.S. it's not as common. But if you look globally, uh, most statistics show, it's kind of a range, but most statistics that I've been using in my, um, in my world of writing and, and sharing is about 55 to 59,000 deaths uh, per year. And really most of those, these are human deaths, most of those are from Asia and Africa. So it's, it's and you know, those whole continents. So it's generally thought um, at least at some level to be true that vaccination is just so expensive or, or maybe even just too difficult due to government or public health infrastructure or just, you know, the willpower to, to carry it out may not be there. But that is the primary countries where you still unfortunately see high levels of death from rabies. Yeah. Now, how about rabies in the U.S.? I mean, th we only see zero to two cases, uh, human deaths a year. Um, however, look through the news, you see animal cases reported right. all the time. Dr. Rohde, how many animals are tested for rabies in the U.S. annually, and what percentage are positive? Those are great questions. Um, so looking in the United States, you hit the nail on the head. It's, it's still rare, which is a great thing in the U.S. Um, really one to three cases kind of reported annually. And and I had some, you know, I have some updated data for you, unfortunately, tonight. Um, really from 2008 to 2017, there were 23 cases of human rabies. But as you know, uh, there was an additional case in January of 18 in Florida, in your state. Mm -hmm. And now today we learned it, unfortunately, looks like a Kent County woman in Delaware has died from rabies. And in that state, that's the first fatality since about 1941. So if you look at the time frame now from 2008 to 2018, we're looking at 25 human cases in the United States. When you switch that gear and look at animals, uh, it's a pretty phenomenal number and, and kind of sad in a sense. A, a roughly 120,000 animals or more are tested for rabies each year in the United States. And typically the number is anywhere between 5 to 6% are found to be rabid. And the proportion of those animals really depends on the species that you're looking at. So if you break it down a little bit, it's less than 1% in domestic animals, you know, so dogs and cats and things like that, maybe even livestock. But when you look at wildlife, it's greater than 10%. So that's an important point to make. Yeah. Wild, wild animals account for about 92% of the reported cases of rabies in any given year. And I bet you know which ones are number one. Good old bats. Yeah, I, guess, um, I think it's state dependent though, right? It, it is, yeah. it is. But if you look at if you look at the U.S., that's kind of the typical numbers yeah. that at least fall out pretty pretty common. Bats, uh, raccoons are, you know, as you know, just crazy on the East Coast, mm -hmm. and then skunks and fox follow. Yeah. All right, so we're getting close to a hard break, so we'll come back with uh, Dr. Rohde um, after the commercials. But if you've been watching the news, the CDC did put out some interesting stuff on sexually transmitted diseases in the in this country, and uh, the numbers look bleak. Uh, ST diagnoses have uh, set a brand new record, exceeding la uh, 2016 numbers by 200,000 cases, and last year marked the fourth consecutive year of STD increases. That's, that includes gonorrhea, syphilis, and chlamydia. So um, not some good news there. So anyway, we'll be talking more about rabies after the break. Stick with us.
Welcome back to Outbreak News This Week, your source for all the news about worms and germs. Here's your host, microbiologist and editor of OutbreakNewsToday.com, Robert Harriman. Well, welcome back to the show. And let's go ahead and continue our discussion of rabies with Texas State University professor, Dr. Rodney Rohde. As you mentioned in the early part of the interview, you've worked in the field of rabies in the state of Texas. Um, Dr. Rohde, how does public health deal with rabies in your state? You know, what are the, what are the general procedures and protocols? Sure. So rabies is a reportable disease in Texas, and it's in, in I think almost every every state, if not all states in the United States. And not to get too gruesome about this, but you know, what you test for rabies in Texas is the tissue found in brain. So in any in any part of this state at any given time, if there's a suspicious animal for rabies, uh, they you know can be observed for a quarantine time. But if it comes to the point where it's going to be time for testing that animal, um, then it's going to be uh, shipped to one of the four major Texas rabies labs in Texas. That's Austin, San Antonio, Houston, or El Paso. And when they ship them there, they will test them with the gold standard for the rabies um, detection, and that is known as the direct fluorescent antibody test. Where I was working in Austin for that decade, you know, that's the that's the workhorse of detection. It's still the gold standard. And in Austin, we also could do uh, specialized antigenic and molecular typing to kind of identify and, and really characterize the type of rabies virus variant. Now, as you mentioned, the diagnosis of rabies in an animal is commonly, well, almost exclusively done by the DFA test, the direct fluorescent antibody. Can you describe to the audience how this works? Yeah, I would love to. This is kind of a, this is a classic um, antigen antibody test. And so let me kind of just set it up for you. We mentioned the brain is the primary specimen, especially for animal rabies. So once we have that brain, in, in a laboratory that's doing that testing. There's really three primary sections that you're going to look at. You're going to look at the brain stem, you're going to look at the brain cerebellum, and you're going to look at the hippocampus. And so those, those parts are dissected out of a brain. They are prepared as smears on a glass slide of some sort. And then you're going to fix those with a little acetone just to kind of stick them to the to this glass, and then it's kind of ingenious and yet elegant when you do this next test. It's called direct fluorescent antibody test for a reason, and that's because you have basically purchased antibodies that have a fluorescent label attached to them, chemically attached. So imagine an antibody like a capital letter Y, and on the long uh, single arm of that Y, there's going to be this fluorescent label chemically attached, and then you're going to add that concoction of antibody to the actual slide, and if that brain tissue has the virus, there will be viral antigens. Antigens are basically proteins, and if there's a match, if that antibody matches those rabies viral proteins or antigens during an incubation step, they're going to latch on. And by latch on, I mean it's going to be a very strong reaction that occurs. It's often described as kind of a lock and key docking reaction. You're going to rinse that, and then you're going to take it into a dark room, and you're going to put it on a special microscope that has a UV and ultraviolet source. And the, and the beauty of this simple test is this, this might take just an hour or so to kind of throw together uh, and, and follow the procedures that are set up. And then when you sit down in that dark room to look at it, if that reaction has occurred because it's positive, that fluorescent label is going to just fluoresce once that UV light hits it. And you see a very interesting looking field of apple green fluorescence, almost like looking at the night sky of stars, but apple green. And that is a positive. If, however, there was not rabies virus on that slide during the rinse step, you're going you're gonna to wash away the antibody because it didn't lock up. Right. And when you look at that slide um, without that 
that reaction, you'll just see kind of this reddish to blackish uh, field, which are known as negative. So as simple as that sounds, and it is it is pretty straightforward. It does take time. Um, I went through you know quite a bit of training when I first um, started doing this procedure and these processes, and with time you become an expert, like with anything. But even with that, because of the high fatality of rabies, uh, typically always two or more microscopic readers are doing that test, and then they're comparing results. Um, and then ultimately, if it's positive, those results get called out to physicians and our veterinarians, or other, uh, you know, professionals to kind of help with the follow-up. Yeah, very interesting. Um, now, in May, uh, the CDC published a paper on a new rabies test, the LN34 test. It's a real-time PCR test for postmortem rabies diagnostics. Um, Dr. Rody, how does this test work, and what are the, are there advantages over DFA? Yeah, this is really exciting, Robert. Um, you know, for somebody that's been looking at rabies for plus 20 years now, this is there's been kind of this ongoing kind of moving forward um, of looking for, you know, perhaps a new gold standard, if you will, one that would be more rapid, one that would be uh, automatable, you know, able to put it in a automated type of laboratory um, piece of equipment and maybe do more specimens at one time and so forth. So there's definitely some advantages in the molecular world trying to do this. What's interesting about this assay, and it, it just came out, so this is quite recent. Um, it's called a PAN, P-A-N, Lysivirus Real-Time RT-PCR Assay. And as you know, PAN kind of means kind of everything. So that's what's the beauty of this is that it, it's, it's going to be able to cover a lot of different variants. So the, the LN34 really represents a strong candidate kind of for these rabies post-mortem diagnostics because it can detect RNA. So you're looking at the nucleic acid, not protein, mm -hmm. and you're looking across a diverse lysivirus genus. So, so there's different genotypes within rabies, and this will really help, you know, if it works out to, to really feel more confident about not missing maybe some oddball variant that that you might miss on another test. So it, it offers the potential of high sensitivity. It offers the potential for use with deteriorated tissues, which is not friendly on the DFA, Correct. Uh, because sometimes you'll have contamination from bacteria and things like that. And relatively user-friendly if you get it set up in an automated system. But but the the primary piece of this, if if I was to share with you, the, the, the primary author, his name was Dugante, and he, uh, what he did with this assay development is he looked at 14 laboratories to try to validate this somewhat. And they used almost 3,000 samples. About 1,000 of those were DFA-positive rabies from Africa, the Americas, Asia, Europe, and the Middle East. So they tried to get a variety of, of uh, variants. It showed on this kind of early testing, high diagnostic specificity, 99.7%, which is important mm -hmm. uh, to make sure it's it's actually rabies. And then also high sensitivity, 99.9%. And as you know, sensitivity is more like um, the screen part where you're trying to make sure you don't miss any weak positives or anything like that. Mm -hmm. And really when they compared that to the DFA, um, no... DFA positive samples were negative with the LN34, so that was very good. Uh, the the LN34 exhibited very low variability and re repeatability and reproducibility studies. So just it was really good. And, and some of the advantages of it that you asked, I think in my mind, is that it works on a variety of specimens from fresh, frozen. Um, even archived, you know, tissue that's archived or, and formal and fixed type of systems or deteriorated decomposing tissue, those are definite advantages mm -hmm. over the DFA because we run into some some extra steps that you have to deal with on a on a protein types of test. So really, at this time, I'm very um, I'm excited and optimistic about it. I still, you know, like everyone else, will want to see. Um, you know, more 
more reproducibility by different labs, looking at inconclusives or other types of of strains of rabies that are out there to kind of make sure we don't have any false negatives or things like that that are that are coming out of it. But so far, it looks really reliable and really robust. So we'll kind of see what happens as it unfolds. Yeah, and you don't see the DFA test going away anytime soon. No, I really don't. You know, the cost, the, the relatively low cost and the relative ease of use for the DFA. I mean, you can really do a lot of samples still, and it and it's obviously proven itself over decades and decades. So I don't see it going away quietly. It'll probably be kicking and screaming. But even though I was trained on that gold standard and, and I believe in it, I am excited about a possible automated molecular assay that, you know, I mean, just imagine if you could take this type of technology into a country with with some grants and with some support and create kind of a centralized rabies testing center where there's no um, variability or not not much you know you have an automated system and really all you're working on is is getting samples to the lab and then letting the the automation take care of it for you yeah um Let's, let's go ahead and switch gears to human testing. And you know, sure. as every now and then, it's necessary to test a person uh, to diagnose the rabies antemortem or before death. Um, Dr. Rody, how is this done and what samples are required? So antemortem, this is a great question because this is another public, general public question a lot of time. You know, everybody thinks there's some kind of simple uh rapid point of care test you can do for rabies like you can do for strep throat or something like that and there's really not um, remember rabies is neurotropic so it can actually come and go in like saliva and CSF and other types of samples so this makes it tricky so really there's several tests uh, if you're looking at rabies antemortem that is before death in humans really no single test is trusted to be sufficient so the types of test, um, the types of samples rather that are performed are typically saliva, serum, spinal fluid, and skin biopsies of actual hair follicles at the the bottom nape of the neck. And saliva is usually tested by virus isolation, so they'll put it into um, CNS cells to actually try to grow it, or they may use molecular. Uh, RT-PCR, which we've talked about, it's called reverse transcription polymerase chain reaction that helps amplify the RNA. And then the serum and the spinal fluid can also be tested for antibodies to rabies virus, which is a more indirect kind of circumstantial evidence. And then skin biopsies um, that I mentioned along those cutaneous nerves at the base of the hair follicles can also sometimes show show rabies uh, types of presence. So. So anti-mortem is done, obviously, to try to help uh, identify, you know, what's going on with a human case, but but it is not a 100% guarantee. You kind of have to look at multiple specimens over a time period to make sure you're not missing something. Yeah, and, and how often is that really done? Because usually if you have an exposure, uh, they're just going to go ahead and get the post-prophylaxis, right? Right. Yeah. As far as the the testing itself, how yeah, often? Yeah, yeah, I would think that it, it's really patient specific. Um, mm -hmm. It kind of differs, but certainly when they first suspect it, and then obviously if they're coming up negative, they're probably going to be looking daily for a while until they can can rule out rabies or rule it in. And and sometimes that also means, as you would expect, they might be looking for other encephalitic viruses like you know West Nile virus or or other types of things that might cause some kind of similar symptoms and signs. Yeah. Okay, well, there's a topic that is so critical concerning rabies, and no matter which expert I talk to, I always have to cover this, and that's um, uh, what we were just mentioning, post-exposure prophylaxis. Um, Dr. Rohde, can you go over the appropriate procedures for post-exposure prophylaxis, please? I would love to. It's so important. Um, as you know, and you've mentioned this earlier, but let's just make the statement again. Once you see symptoms and signs uh, from a rabies infection, the mortality, the death rate really approaches 100%. So even with the excitement of the Milwaukee Protocol uh, that happened several years ago that helped save a few lives now, 
that mortality is still high and still very scary. So it really, really hammers home the point um, anytime we do an interview about this to remind, remind people that animal histories and education of the public and healthcare is super critical regarding kind of what a rabies exposure really is. So once we know that happens, and you know what really is a post-exposure regimen or prophylaxis, it really involves a couple of things. It involves the administration of something called human rabies immune globulin, called HRIG, H-R-I-G, and that's really only given once, and it's typically at the bite site. So let's say you get bit uh, on the on the thigh. Uh, they're going to take that HRIG and they're going to give a lot of little mini injections all around the bite. And what this does, Robert, is HRIG is really just a, a pool of human rabies antibodies. So the idea is that if you inject that all around the bite as soon as possible, it will tie up and neutralize rabies virus before it has a chance to enter the central nervous system. So that's really helpful and critical because you basically help slow down or stop the infection right at the bite site. But of course, the other, the other arm of this uh, regimen is that you go through a series of four one milliliter rabies vaccinations. And typically, those four injections are going to be for um, healthy or, or other types of persons. If you have an immunocompromised person, you'll actually have a, a fifth uh, vaccination. So it starts at day zero, whatever that is, and then day three, day seven, and day 14. And then if you're immunocompromised, you may give a fifth vaccination on day 28. So it kind of rolls out for about a month. The only other point around that um, post-exposure comment is that if, if you have a patient who you know has been previously um, vaccinated, they've received either pre- or post-exposure rabies prophylaxis, they really only should get two rabies boosters following an exposure on day zero and three. So for instance, I've worked in rabies laboratories for the first 10 years of my career. I've been uh, vaccinated with pre-exposure vaccine to kind of help with accidents in the lab, if I was to get bit by a rabid skunk in Texas, um, I would definitely want to tell somebody uh, of my background because I would probably only receive two injections. Mm -hmm. So just important to let the make sure the audience understands the uh, HRIG is essentially preformed antibody. That's correct. And the vaccine itself is going to help the individual produce antibody. That's correct. We often talk about that. You just gave one of my lectures, Robert. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, we always, right? I mean, you know, you know this back in the day, you, you have passive and active immunization. So yes. that HRIG is really preformed. Um, it's, it's, it's taken from kind of a pool of antibodies and it acts immediately. So the great thing about HRIG is that it's very immediate and it helps tie up that that rabies virus that's in the bite and so that can help prevent any any ongoing infection and then the vaccine itself is going to stimulate your body's immune system to create its own antibody so it's called active immunity right. and the other great thing about active immunity as you know is it creates memory mm -hmm. so for instance like i mentioned i've had pre-exposure vaccine to rabies even if, you know, God forbid something happened where I didn't realize it, I got nicked by a bat, and I had no idea it happened, theoretically, I may be fine because I've had the boosters and the vaccine early pre-exposure and my body's got memory. So that's kind of the idea behind the, the vaccine itself. Right. And the HRIG is also useful because it takes your body, what, about two weeks correct about two weeks to produce any antibody right that's correct so you're kind of getting you're kind of covering every base yeah. you know to kind of help prevent that infection from occurring okay so I, yeah just definitely want the audience to understand if you think you've been exposed if, if you uh wake up and there's a bat in your house or if you get obviously bitten by a feral animal or a wild animal um uh, 
this stuff will save your life. I mean, obviously discuss it with your physician or the Absolutely. public health department and uh, they will give you the direction. All right, Dr. Rohde, any final thoughts on rabies you'd like to discuss? Sure. You, you hit some nice points there at the very end. And I would also like to add to that, you know, um, there is more important in any country you live in uh, than to vaccinate your animals, uh, whether that's your favorite pet dog or cat and even livestock. Um, those are very important deterrents. It's basically building a barrier between animals and humans. So that's really important. And I can't overemphasize what Robert just mentioned to the audience. If you have any, any suspicion that you've had an exposure to an animal um, and you have no way of knowing they've been vaccinated, so especially wildlife or a feral cat or so forth, please see your physician and follow through on that because no exposure is too small to at least consider. Let somebody else make that decision so that they can kind of rule out or rule in post-exposure prophylaxis for you because it will save your life. The other quick comment is just to remind the audience that World Rabies Day is coming up on September 28th. So remember I told you that was past year's birthday. There is a lot of stuff going on uh, with World Rabies Day, so be sure and look at Robert's show and other outlets to kind of learn more about rabies. And I'm really excited. Um, I've told Robert this, but I'm working on a book uh, that's been um, kind of a, a labor of love the past few months, and I'm I'm targeting really physicians and healthcare practitioners around clinical guidelines. So I'll be sure, I can't say much more about it, but when that comes together and is published, I'll be sure and share that. And our thoughts are is that even physicians and even nurses and even people like medical laboratory professionals need to sometimes be reminded about the, the nuances of a rabies exposure determination and kind of what to do about it. Well, very good. I look forward to checking out your book when it's published. And um, uh, Dr. Rohde's done several articles that I've read in the past uh, on the topic of rabies, and I will go ahead and put those links up on the website when uh, this audio gets published. So I want to thank you, Dr. Rodney Rohde, for your time and your expertise, sir. Thank you so much, Robert. I always appreciate the time to educate the public. All right. Well, I hope you enjoyed that very informative interview with Dr. Rohde. Um, rabies is a fascinating topic, and I'm sure that uh, you would have enjoyed that and got something out of it. Good stuff. Well, let's look at some local news. Um, believe it or not, for the first time in 20 years, Pinellas County is seeing measles. 1998 was the last time a measles case was reported. And since August 13th, there has been seven confirmed cases. All seven people were unvaccinated. Really hard to believe in this day and age, but yeah, that's what's going on. So you got to you got to be encouraged to vaccinate your children and yourself. And and if you're going overseas, you got to be appropriately vaccinated because I mean, look at what's going on in Europe right now tens of thousands of cases. And so if you're traveling to Europe and you're unvaccinated, your risk is really up there. So yeah, keep that in mind. It's uh, just way too important. And it's not it's the mild disease that a lot of people like to say, it can be very, very serious. And we've talked about measles on this show a gazillion times, so I'm not gonna get into that right now. Um, one of the more fascinating uh, uh, news stories in the past week has been the discovery of a case of Atypical H-type bovine spongiform encephalopathy, or BSE. You may know it better as mad cow disease. And there, and this was the, this case in Florida was the sixth case ever in an animal in the United States. So that's pretty big news. Uh, unfortunately, uh, at no time was this animal a risk to the food supply or to human health. So um, good stuff. You, you can check that story out at outbreaknewstoday.com. And I want to thank my guest, Dr. Rodney Rohde. I want to thank Michael. And I want to thank you for listening. And I will see you next week on Outbreak News This Week. Good night. And God bless. Thank you for listening to Outbreak News This Week with Robert Harriman. 
If you missed any part of today's program, you can listen to the podcast anytime on our website, outbreaknewstoday.com. Make sure to join us here next week for Outbreak News This Week with Robert Harriman. 